Is there a thing duller than a long wait in a doctor's office lobby? Imagine. It's 5 a.m. and you're stuck in one. The interior is mundane and ordinary. Rows of faux leather chairs squeaky to touch. Muted Seinfeld reruns on a TV in the corner. Tired-looking patients staring down at their screens. But unlike regular clinic visitors, every one of them has opioid dependence. They are here to prevent withdrawals before their workday starts. If you live in the United States, chances are you drove or walked by a place like that not even realizing it. There is rarely a sign above the front windows. You could only learn a facility's name by stepping in or searching for one online. The new Light Recovery Center, Sunshine Institute, Second Chance Clinic. More than 300,000 Americans are enrolled in the programs these places provide. The number may seem large, but with 10 million people who are addicted to opioids in the country, it may not be big enough. When it is time, the nurse will call a patient's name and they will walk into a simple first aid room. The patient will sit on the exam table and the doctor will give them a disposable medicine cap with tablets of methadone and some water. After the addicts take their medicine, they will see the same lobby, the same nurse, the same doctor 24 hours later. This unexciting ritual makes it possible for them to hold jobs, raise children, go on vacations, vote, to have a normal life. But commuting to a clinic every day seems like a lot of trouble for a pill. That's because methadone, like street heroin, is an opioid. Every dose of it is carefully decided and every pill must be accounted for. For most people, methadone is a dangerous drug. For opioid users, methadone is a lifesaver in the very literal sense. But before the benefits of methadone became evident, drug addicts had little chance to not only overcome their addiction, but even be considered medical patients in need. That changed when a psychiatrist who treated addicted jazz musicians, a scientist who researched metabolic disorders, and an anesthesiologist from the inner city challenged the status quo. Hi, and welcome to Control Shift, a podcast by Libo Libo Studio and Humble Team. My name is Anatoly Gromov and I'm your host. In this podcast, we discuss stories of professionals, their shifts, and most importantly, the difference they make in the world. And this time, I'm going to tell you a story of how three people with very different backgrounds could see an opioid crisis for what it was when everybody else turned a blind eye. What they had in common was their ability to see past stereotypes. Leaving their preconceived beliefs behind, they made shift in understanding addiction happen and introduced a solution that has been saving lives for over five decades. Addiction is a part of human nature. Yes. Whatever our feelings about it are, it's true. We are wired to crave things that make us feel good. To survive, our species evolved to pursue natural rewards. So every time we eat a calorie-dense birthday cake, or when we succeed in a reproduction attempt, our brain pays us back in endorphins, a type of feel-good molecule. The word endorphin is short for endogenous morphine, a body-produced opioid. We need endorphins to be able to feel safe, calm, loved, to feel normal. It makes pain, physical and emotional, go away. All of us are hooked on it, it is a part of us. 
When heroin was first synthesized in 1874 by English chemist Alder Wright, people got access to something better than a cake that simply triggers endorphin production. Instead, heroin was a substance that acts just like endorphins, skipping the third man altogether. And it hits faster and stronger than any endorphin rush. Heroin's potency was unprecedented and people started misusing it in no time. By the 1930s, an addict officially became a criminal under United States law. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics was established and obtained the President's seal of approval for a criminal approach to the drug problem. The thing is, neither policymakers nor medical professionals considered addiction to be an evolutionary byproduct. If anything was different about addicts, that'd be a weaker wheel. Maybe a natural taste for crime, or psychopathy, blackness, gayness, even musical talent. This is Smoke Rings by Alvin Jones. Among many other jazz musicians, including Sonny Rollins, Chad Baker and Lee Morgan, he was admitted to the narcotic farm in Lexington, Kentucky, the first official addiction treatment facility in the country. The place opened up in 1935. With 1,500 patients at its peak, the narcotic farm was supposed to be an experimental hospital for drug addicts. It employed doctors, nurses, and therapists. A 1,000-acre site included a farm to work at. Sounds not bad at all. Medical treatment and psychological help for heroin victims with an idealistic backdrop of southern nature. Add yoga and art therapy and you'll get a modern rehab center. But in reality, doctors and nurses at the narcotic farm were wardens, and the farm was a free labor operation. Called US Public Health Service Hospital on paper, the facility was essentially a prison. Actually, it was renamed a prison years later. This is what one of the inmates, David Deitch, told in the documentary The Narcotic Farm. Lexington was a prison and a hospital and a symbolic and literal expression of America's schizophrenia about how to treat addiction. Is it a medical problem, a social problem, a criminal problem? What is it? Whatever that was, that's where psychiatrist Marie Nicewander came to work after she graduated from Cornell University Medical School in 1944. After getting a degree, Marie first tried to receive a surgical internship in the US Navy to only discover that female surgeons were not welcome there. So she was posted to the narcotic farm instead. Marie hated it. When Roosevelt died, the nurses all cheered, she said in an interview. They would use racial slurs in order black people around. The patients were hardly anything to be desired either. People in prison, including myself, are transformed. But the way the inmates were treated was not the only thing that frustrated Nice Wonder. She was raised by a single mother, a medical researcher herself, to believe facts, not speculations. And the narcotic farm ran on speculations. For Marie, a public notion that addicts were criminals that deserved harsh treatment was bogus, unsupported by serious science. Unable to last for more than a year, she returned to New York City where she grew up. Back home, things didn't look bright either, so Nice Wonder decided to take the matter into her own hands. She started her own foundation for drug addiction rehabilitation and wrote a book about the psychiatric aspects of drug abuse treatment. In her work, she chose a more humane, empathetic approach, talking therapy. But something didn't end up. Nine out of ten patients in her program still ended up relapsing, just like at the narcotic farm. Dr. Nice Wonder was sure there must have been something that worked better. Thank you. 
Vincent Doe had nothing to do with addiction. A Harvard alumnus and experienced medical researcher, he actually was studying metabolic disorders. Until one day in 1962, he was asked, truly out of the blue, to become a chairman of the New York City Committee on Narcotics. First he refused, but then joined as a co-chairman. The more time he was studying addiction, the more fascinated he was getting. The research in the field was limited, but his intuition was telling him that addicts were sick, not sinful, and addiction was a disease to be cured rather than a criminal act to be punished. It was clear that there's something special about addicts. This is Dr. Vincent Doe in his interview for the documentary Methadone, The Hope for a New Life. Because many, many people are exposed to narcotic drugs in the course of medical practice, and only a minority of them become addicted. And it did not seem satisfactory to say they were simply morally weak people. The one person I found that made good sense to me in the medical way was Marie Nicewander. The title of the book, The Drug Addict as a Patient. This totally refocused the field because the drug addict is seen as a pariah or as a problem or as a deviant or whatever else. But here, she brought the matter right to the middle. The drug addict is a patient who needs medical care or medical understanding. Even before starting with the committee, Doe was known for a hands-on approach to his work. He liked to get into the weeds and see things with his own eyes. Once, while researching fatty acids and glucose metabolism, he started each day with a high-fat breakfast followed by blood sugar testing. With narcotics research, he of course was not going to become a subject himself, but he still needed some empirical data to prove the theory that opioid-dependent people should be treated as medical patients. Dole arranged for Nicewanter to come work with him at the Rockefeller University where he managed to get some funding for his project. The idea behind the research was simple. Admit volunteer heroin addicts to the clinic as patients and study how they behave under the influence of different drugs. One of those opioids was methadone. A synthetic narcotic, an odorless white powder or liquid, originally developed by Nazi Germany to treat wounded soldiers. There was anecdotal evidence of addicts who successfully replaced other opioids with methadone. It miraculously curbed withdrawals and didn't provide any noticeable high. For both Dole and Nice Wonder, these accounts were negligible. Without scientific research on the drug, it was only rational to think that exchanging one opioid for another wouldn't help anyone. But they decided, why not? It's an opioid, so let's see how it works. Twenty-two people were admitted to the research clinic, and Marie started administering the narcotics. A strange picture to imagine a doctor providing people dependent on heroin with the exact thing that made them sick in the first place. Most of the patients were not happier than before. With drugs injected on schedule, they couldn't stop looking at the clock. Going in and out of the withdrawals, comfortable for maybe an hour a day in total. However, two of the volunteers felt very different from the rest. When they were given their opioids, they didn't get high like the rest. Instead, their withdrawal symptoms disappeared completely. Compared to patients provided with heroin, who could think of nothing more than the next dose, these two quickly started showing interest in hygiene, hobbies and social bonding, things that are far out of reach for many addicts. They didn't even require psychiatric help. For Marie, who still banked on the talking therapy approach, the normality they expressed was a surprise. These two patients were, you guessed it, on methadone. Of course, Nice Wonder switched all the patients to methadone and was amazed when all of them started to feel better almost instantly. But still, she was not sold. She had seen too many medical miracles that had not panned out. Marie was waiting for the second shoe to drop, sitting in the ward in total terror every night, 
in her own words. While Marie was biting her nails and kept her volunteers fully supplied with their doses, Dole took methadone to the laboratory and tried to understand what made it so different from other opioids. What he found out not only explained why it worked, it became proof that addiction was not a choice or a type of criminal behavior. It was a disorder. Heroin delivers fast. It bombards brain receptors and makes them light up all at the same time, producing myriad electric impulses. That's what makes a person high on heroin feel incredible, sensational and at peace. With such an enormously high inventory of fake endorphins, the real deal is not produced. When the rush subsidizes, endorphins are depleted from the system. The withdrawals begin and the person starts looking for a fix. The cycle repeats. But not with methadone. Vincent Dole saw that methadone stayed in the system for as much as 24 hours and it seemed to be working in a more gentle, subtle way, closer to the body's natural endorphins. Shooting heroin is similar to delivering a hammer blow to the nervous system. Methadone, in comparison, bathed the affected nervous tissues with a constant soothing trickle of the drug. For the first time since the start of their addiction, the volunteer patients felt normal, like non-addicts feel every day. In fact, even if they did use heroin, there was no high, or in other words, no reason to take it. Methadone just took place for heroin like heroin stole the spot from endorphins. But still, it was not endorphins. Without methadone, the symptoms of heroin withdrawals in those in nice wondrous patients would return. It would be fair to say that they stayed addicts. Ironically enough, not in 1965. Here's the definition of an addict from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. An addict is a person who habitually uses a habit-forming narcotic drug, thereby endangering public morals, health, safety and welfare. People who were absorbed by Dole and Nice Wonder did not endanger public morals, safety and welfare. They had all of the makings of being productive members of their communities. One of the volunteers confessed that when he encountered his dealer on the street, instead of scoring heroin, he treated himself to some ice cream and went home. All in all, it was a two birds one stone situation. Not only the pair of researchers accidentally developed a working replacement therapy, they also had evidence that none of their patients stabilized on methadone showed signs of sociopathy or taste for criminal activities. The research subject were regular people with an unfortunate illness. For 1965, an explosive conclusion. When that groundbreaking research by well-known, respected scientists was published in the Journal of American Medical Association, it had an immediate impact. Doe's program started receiving substantial funding. He, and by then his wife, Marie Nicewander, opened a methadone treatment center in Beth Israel Hospital in Manhattan. Medical professionals in other cities started following suit. Less than 10 years later, 80,000 Americans were enrolled in methadone clinics. While Vincent Dole and Marie Nicewander were concluding their research, Americans started to get drafted to war. The United States entered Vietnam. Soon, it became little to no secret that American troops deployed to Southeast Asia were using various drugs and heroin in particular. It was not only a painkiller that injured soldiers could rely upon. They self-medicated to alleviate the stress, fear and anxiety military action was causing. When survived war veterans returned home, 20% of them were heroin addicts. However, only a fraction of those, about 5%, relapsed upon their return to the US. The rest returned to the drug-free lives without skipping a beat. 
with a 90% relapse rate among domestic opioid users. The contrast was striking. For Dr. Benny J. Prim, who worked relentlessly to establish addiction treatment programs in Brooklyn, these numbers were perplexing. Dr. Prim started his practice as an anesthesiologist in Harlem Hospital in 1963, one of the very few black doctors to hold a license at the time. Back then, Harlem was the most impoverished and segregated part of New York, and Prim's job was rough. His shifts ran from 4 p.m. on Friday through Sunday morning, hours when largely beaten, stabbed and shot people were rushed to the ER. And to Dr. Prim's horror, 9 out of 10 emergency surgeries performed during his shifts were associated with illicit opioids. What he realized, especially after the data on addicted Vietnam War veterans was published, is that the problem of addiction had yet another dimension. The economic and social health of the communities affected both the rate with which people got addicted and their rehabilitation success. When deployed men re-entered their everyday American lives, often in peaceful suburbs, surrounded by families, supported by neighbors and social systems, their need for the euphoric high diminished. But the communities Dr. Prim served simply couldn't get access to a lot of things the rest of the population had. Financial stability, health services, good schools, employment availability, equal opportunities, you name it. Brooklyn had 12 times more residents addicted to heroin than in the whole country on average. While municipalities next door, just like Manhattan, put some trust and money into developing counseling and detox programs, Dr. Prim struggled to make ends meet. The hospital, where he was able to establish a small detox program, faced bankruptcy. Desperate and exhausted, Prim decided to follow Malcolm X's advice. If you want something, you have better make some noise. In March 1968, Prim and his friend and colleague Tom Matthew, along with 50 fatigued addicts who wanted to receive treatment from Prim, cut the padlock chain on an abandoned apartment complex in Harlem. The group got inside the building and started a cleanup. When arrived reporters asked what they were doing, the answer was simple. We are taking over. Police were called. Surprised passerbys expressed concerns. But miraculously, after a day-long standoff, the city of New York gave Prim and Matthew the ownership of the building. The ARTC, Addiction Research Treatment Corporation, was created. The ARTC made a quick and significant difference for the community. Yet it faced the same problem that Dole and Nice Wonders tried to address. The relapse rates were too high. The thing is, Dr. Prim was not satisfied with the maintenance approach suggested by Dole in Nice Wonder. Because in this case, addicts remain addicts. They need methadone every 24 hours, which is clearly not the most sustainable scenario. So he decided to slowly lower the dose so his patients get a chance to live a truly normal life. But of course, that would lead to a partial withdrawal, which in turn would create a risk to relapse. When Doe learned of that approach, he hit the ceiling. They didn't know what they were doing, he later said. They literally did not understand what addiction was, what heroin was, why methadone is being used. The hostilities continued for over a decade until Doe traveled from Manhattan to Harlem and saw Benny J. Prim's operation firsthand. Even if he couldn't agree on the methods, both of them fought for the same goal. Later, Prim received a nice Wonder Dole Award given by the American Association for the Treatment of Opioid Dependence. With time, all of them, Mary Nicewander, Vincent Dole, Benny J. Prim, became legends in their field. Some of the doctors and researchers who worked with them in the 60s and 70s are founding members of Stop Stigma Now, the group associated with opioid dependence treatment that promotes the same idea. A drug addict is a medical patient who needs help and the methadone treatment is a big part of it. To this day, it has been implemented over and over with a steady success rate of up to 90%. 
Let's put this story aside for a second. If you've been following our podcast, you probably noticed that this is not the first episode related to healthcare, and probably not the last. There are also more than a few notable cases within this industry in humble teams practice. Today, one of the challenges lays within patient profiling. To put it simply, imagine you decide to take a skiing trip in Alps. Change the scenery from your usual Rocky Mountains holiday. And unfortunately, you get mildly injured on the slope. So the challenge for the doctors is to get your medical record right away in order to provide you with the right treatment. But there is no unified international format and protocol for patient profiles. And given the fact that sometimes your health history matters more than momentary diagnostics, the importance of unifying the format of medical records and providing the right infrastructure is very, very high. Now, Humble Team has been lucky enough to be able to work with several startups that focus on building the right infrastructure. Everything between EKG sensors for heart and lungs monitoring and virtual primary care, including the first on the market GDPR compliant messenger for European hospitals. They all aim to provide doctors and patients with a consistent and secure unified profiling. Humble Team designs sustainable product solutions to put this all together one day. Visit humbleteam.com to get started. And now, let's go back to our story. There are still a couple of more things worth mentioning. For Americans who attended school between 1993 and 2009, this bit might be as familiar as the Star Spangled Banner. The Project Dare song was popular when Nancy Reagan started the campaign to urge kids to stay away from drugs. Despite the monumental shift in understanding and treating addiction, Reagan's continued to follow the traditional agenda created by the Nixon administration that gave a start to war on drugs. However, methadone clinics managed to withstand the ever-increasing regulation and criticism from the government. But then, a new big hit street drug entered the landscape. For the US government, a bigger fish to fry than heroin, crack cocaine. Cocaine is an intense stimulant that one can overdose on. In the 80s, crack cocaine ruled the streets. But it is not an opioid and methadone, for all its worth, is useless against it. That's where we could end our story about methadone. A niche, if not obsolete, solution to a problem that was not even that relevant anymore. That may have been true if a miracle painkiller OxyContin didn't exist. In 1996, Purdue Pharma invented the pill that contained a massive dose of semi-synthetic opioid, oxycodone heroin's and morphine's cousin, but way more potent. What makes OxyContin unique is on the outside. The active ingredient oxycodone is coated in contin, thus the name. When the pill is swallowed, the contin system makes it possible to digest the medication slowly. It provides the extended release effect up to 12 hours, while morphine wears off in just 4 or at least that's what Purdue Pharma claimed. For those patients struggling with acute and chronic pain like the elderly, cancer patients, car crash survivors, this was the pitch. With such prolonged effect, they could be able to finally catch some sleep. And when the pill entered the market, it has quickly become a go-to drug for pain management. However, the Sacklers, the family that owned Purdue Pharma, needed more commercial success than that. And they came up with an idea. What if they tried to sell the drug as a treatment for less severe, more common pains? Once you've found the right doctor and have told him or her about your pain, don't be afraid to take what they give you. Often, it will be an opioid medication. This is the original advertisement for OxyContin just a fracture of all marketing materials that were provided to doctors, 
from huge urban hospitals to one-room general practices in the country. Medical workers, trusting the research provided by Purdue Pharma, started prescribing OxyContin right, left, and center. It would start innocently enough. A manual labor worker throws their back where a suburban mom complains about an old injury. Doctors, who genuinely aim to improve the patient's lives, prescribe the worker and the mom some OxyContin. With a new prescription slip on hand, patients went to pharmacies to get the medication. Two, three hundred milligrams of oxycodone, an opioid multiple times stronger than heroin, were brought home and stored in medicine cabinets and on kitchen counters. And if this seemed a bit too irresponsible, Purdue Pharma had it covered. Some patients may be afraid of taking opioids because they're perceived as too strong or addictive. But that is far from actual fact. Less than 1% of patients taking opioids actually become addicted. Worry not. It's all good. What's more, most people loved the medication. It simply worked. OxyContin sales skyrocketed. In five years on the market, the product accumulated $3 billion in revenue. But long before the money started pouring into Sackler's bank accounts, the reports of withdrawals from OxyContin typical for opioid use came in. To address that, Purdue Pharma suggested just give people medication more often. Shortly after that, the first cases of overdose were registered and doctors started to sound the alarm. How the overdose was possible if OxyContin was supposed to last a patient 12 hours? And what about the special coating? Well, Purdue Pharma simply used fraudulent research papers that supported claims about its miracle product from the very start. Instead of promised 12 hours, it actually wore off in about 8. Nausea, sweating, fatigue, vomiting and even hallucinations often on top of the pain that is no longer suppressed by the drug, and there are no naturally curing endorphins to relieve it. Just like heroin, a patient would build up a tolerance and require more medication they are now dependent on. The more OxyContin was needed, the harsher the withdrawals became. And what about the special coating? As I said, without it, oxycodone, a potent opioid, would make a person extremely high. It doesn't really take much effort to conclude that if content coating is chewed, scraped off or destroyed in another way, the effects of the drug hit hard and almost immediately. By the way, if all this doesn't seem credible to you, feel free to read more about the history of OxyContin and the Sackler family. Look up the book by journalist Patrick Redden Keefe, Empire of Pain. So that's how the biggest opioid crisis started. And in the years to come, it would get out of hand. Of 10 million Americans who misuse opioids each year, only 7% are addicted to street heroin. The rest, a staggering 9.3 million people, consume opioid-based painkillers with OxyContin way in the lead. When OxyContin was developed, Purdue Pharma had to decide what communities would be the most profitable markets. Doctors who knew little about addiction and practiced in rural and industrial places would be perfect to approach. Regions where people made living by manual labor were great demographics. For Purdue Pharma, places like that were a golden goose. That's how OxyContin came to Appalachia. stepdad having all these like scars like all over his legs and stuff and they looked like someone like put a cigarette burn out on you and then at the time i remember asking him being like what are those scars because you know kids are curious and he would just be like oh you don't need to know about this and 
honestly, I don't even remember what he would say, but he would never give me a straight answer. And then, of course, I learned, like, way later on that those were, like, you know, injection scars. This is Dr. Kelsey Lamb from Moorhead, Kentucky. When a teenager in Appalachia, Dr. Lamb learned firsthand what prescribed opioids, mostly OxyContin, can do to people, their families, and their social circles. And she also learned that methadone is a reliable way to help. Dr. Lamb got her medical degree from the University of Louisville and started helping patients with opioid use disorder receive methadone treatment. These days, she practices in Detroit, Michigan, one of the many places dramatically affected by opioids. I guess I never thought I would work in opioid addiction treatment at all, but I remember seeing it as a huge issue. Like, people were literally dying. Or I was seeing people, because I went to high school and college in the same town, and there were people that I went to high school with that you would hear of later that would become addicted to opioids, and then of course their lives were just completely out of control. Um, and it was sad to see. Every morning, Dr. Lem arrives at her clinic. The patients are already waiting. Last year, magazines on the table, a muted TV in the corner, and a friendly nurse. Often when it's their turn to get in the exam room, Kelsey treats them like a good friend. The news exchange about work, friends, and family precedes the administration of the medication. But usually there is not much to report. They saw each other last morning. Yet the gradual improvements patients show is always inspiring for both parties. Dr. Lamb and the people she helps hope they see each other the next day. Everyone who feels like methadone is an option for them may show up at any maintenance clinic and ask for help. Usually, to stay in the program, patients must show up every day, attend talking therapy, and even come to Narcotics Anonymous meetings. The clinics also must perform audits, keep tidy record keeping, and account for every dose they release. The rules are strict, and everyone, doctors and patients alike, needs to comply with them for the methadone clinic to stay open. But as opposed to treatment, in the matter of public opinion, not much changed since Dr. Prim and his people had to barricade buildings and fight to remain open. Some of us couldn't be indifferent to people with opioid use disorder who come to a building a block away from our house. Even if the patients indeed only use heavily regulated methadone, better safe than sorry, right? This viewpoint is called nimbyism, not in my backyard. Some people see a bigger problem too. Even if the facilities for methadone treatment are tucked far away from respectable neighborhoods, why should the government spend taxpayer money on addicts? The obvious answer is that methadone treatment is a humane, factually sound way to approach addiction, as Dolan Nice wonder proved decades ago. But there is also some simple math to it. A year of methadone treatment costs about $4,700 per patient, while imprisoning a person who broke the law to stop the withdrawal costs approximately $24,000 a year. You have to think that even if you don't give a shit about addicts, like it still saves the community money because addicts cost a lot of freaking money on the system. ER visits, say someone's been injecting and then they have all these like abscesses or they have to get their heart valve replaced because they got a heart infection. Um, they're in and out of the system. Their families are involved in like child protective services. They're in and out of jail. They're getting arrested. They're passing HIV, hepatitis C, um, major cost to like emergency medical services for like overdoses. And it really does save a lot of money. Methadone maintenance programs are simply prudent. Every dollar spent on it returns more than $7 to the budget. And it seems like more and more states invest in methadone maintenance. With more research conducted, there is also more trust. In the past 10 years, over 300 new facilities were opened. Vincent Dole, Marie Nicewonder, Benny Jane Prim, and many of their co-workers did not expect to spend their life helping people struggling with addiction. Coming from realms often divided in the debate, science and social justice, pharmacology and psychiatry, 
they pioneered a service that keeps saving lives. Their story illustrated how asking the right questions and leaving all your prejudice aside is the way to approach a complicated problem. But maybe the most important thing about methadone maintenance development is that a service rooted in utmost empathy will never be outdated. People don't wake up dreaming of being addicted to heroin or other pain pills. Um, it's definitely a combination of biological and genetic risk factors and then the environment that they're in. Um, people with these genetic risk factors who have good environments are less likely to fall into the throes of addiction. Um, people with extensive trauma histories or just low socioeconomic status, being in environments where there's lots of addiction and lack of social support, they're much more likely to have addiction. A lot of people, when they first use drugs, that's the first time they've ever experienced joy or happiness. There's nothing else in their life that gives them that feeling. Um, and as humans, you know, we want to be happy and enjoy ourselves. And if drugs are the only thing that can give it to you, you have to have compassion for those people. Since you started listening to this episode of Control Shift, 24 people in the world have overdosed on prescription pills or heroin. Control Shift was brought to you by Libo Libo Studio and Humble Team. Sound design and jingle for this episode were created by Kira Weinstein and also special thanks to Blue Dot Session. The names of everybody who worked on this episode you can find in the description. And I'm your host, Anatoly Gromov. See you in two weeks.